Hello, uh, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to you today. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Unfortunately, I'm stuck here in Melbourne in Australia uh, in my home office. Um, we've just been released from our latest lockdown and our international borders have just opened in the last week. So it wasn't possible for me to get to Amsterdam in time for your Congress. It's an honour and a privilege to be speaking with you today. Um, looking forward to talking with you about that 10 years of research that myself and my colleagues have, have been doing, looking at the role of general practitioners in worker rehabilitation, particularly in Australia. My name's Alex Colley. Uh, I'm the director of the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at, in the School of Public Health at Monash University. Now, relevant to this uh, particular presentation, I should say that I'm not a medical doctor or a general practitioner. My, my training is in psychology and in neuropsychology specifically, but I have spent the last 15 or 20 years studying the interaction between healthcare and workers' compensation systems in Australia, and it's from that perspective that I approach this topic. Uh, there are lots of people who are involved in um, my um, in the work that I'm going to present to you um, today. Here are a list of my collaborators, many from Monash University and from other parts of Australia, including some international speakers as well. And what I'll do is show you uh, work from about uh, a number of different projects, some of which have been funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, some by the Australian Research Council through a variety of different competitive grants and fellowships. And also we've had a lot of support for this program of research from other organisations in Australia, notably our states, territory and, and national workers' compensation regulators. I'd also like to, before I begin, um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'm going to be talking a lot about Australia today and this map here is the Indigenous uh, map of Australia, or the map of Indigenous Australia, which with all of the different language and clan groups represented. And it looks very different to the map that I'll show you um, in the rest of this talk, um, where because we have our workers' compensation schemes divided by states and territories. Um, and I'd really like to pay my respects to Indigenous elders past and present um, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Here's an overview of my presentation. I'll start with a bit of context about Australia's workers' compensation systems, and then speak through a number of particular topics that have been a focus of our research. And I'll finish with some very recent developments in terms of position statement and clinical guidelines. And as I go, I'd like to point out what I think have been some of the challenges and some of the next steps in, in this field in Australia. Uh, so Australia is quite different to the Netherlands in the way that we organise ourselves with respect to social insurance. Um, you may know that Australia has a population of about 25 million people and a labour force of around about 13 million people. And it's a federation of states and, and territories. And that federation really influences the way that we deliver worker rehabilitation in Australia and other forms of social income support. We have three main forms of income support. Um, much like those, at least at a high level, in other countries. So sickness absence systems, which are uh, most often provided by employers in Australia. Workers' compensation systems, which I'll talk quite a lot about today. And also our disability support pension system, which is uh, organised and uh, managed at a national level in our social security system in Australia. Our workers' compensation systems are cause-based insurance systems. And so what that means is that uh, workers need to demonstrate that their injury or illness for which they are making a claim uh, occurred in, in the course of their employment or that it was a work-related injury or illness. And the insurance systems are run by private or public insurers. Uh, and a lot like the systems in North America, we charge employers a premium every year, which is intended to cover the costs of delivering compensation rehabilitation to workers. We have nearly one quarter of a million accepted workers' compensation claims per year, and that's distributed across nine major systems, one in each of the six states, the two territories, and one national system. And healthcare is 
big business in our workers' compensation system. It's the second largest uh, expenditure in these schemes and growing, about $8 billion per annum in healthcare expenditure. In terms of general practitioner consultations, around about two and a half million general practitioner consultations per annum in Australia, which is probably a conservative estimate. And importantly, and this is where some of our real challenges arise in delivering healthcare in our Australian workers' compensation schemes is that, that healthcare is funded by those private or public insurers and insurers retain the decision-making capacity around which healthcare they will and won't pay for. Um, also relevant to a discussion around general practitioners, almost every worker involved in our workers' compensation schemes in Australia report consulting a GP at some point during their recovery and return to work or during the course of their workers' compensation claim. And so general practitioners have a really critical role in our workers' comp schemes, in, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about those roles. Uh, and this is really the reason that we chose a decade ago to start to focus on them. So here's, here's what's been happening this century in Australia, and here's really the problem um, that we have. While we've, and this data is from a national database of workers' compensation statistics, which is compiled by Safe Work Australia, a Commonwealth body. What we've seen is a red gradual reduction over the course of the last 17 or 18 years in the number of uh, claims involving more than five days off work. Uh, about a 20% reduction over since the turn of the century. But at the same time, we've seen a pretty substantial growth in the duration of time that people are taking off work from just over four weeks per average claim up to over six weeks per average claim. So around about 45% growth. Um, so, and what's occurred at the same time over the course of this century is that our the method of managing our workers' compensation scheme and managing the costs in our workers' compensation scheme has really shifted from, um, dis from discussions about eligibility and the duration and types of benefits that are provided to a much stronger focus on supporting workers to recover and return to work. And centrally amongst that discussion has been a, a, really a, a, a discussion and some action on the critical role that general practitioners play in supporting recovery and return to work. And so one of the pleasing things to come out of this scenario where we have a reduction in claims but a growth in the number of people who are taking longer to return to work, has actually been a greater emphasis and focus on healthcare delivery. And it's in that context that we have been studying the role of general practitioners. Uh, so I'd like to now to talk a bit about working in a complex system. Um, this is a, a guide um, prepared quite recently and updated earlier this year in May 2021 by our, one of our national workers' compensation schemes and organisation called ComCare. And I just really wanted to use this as a device to demonstrate the multiple roles and the multiple stakeholders um, in these schemes. So the multiple roles for general practitioners and the multiple stakeholders that GPs will be engaging with in the course of managing and supporting a worker during their workers' compensation claim. So I don't expect you to read the detail on this slide, but here are some of the things that this guide recommends, including things such as managing the recovery pathway, certifying patient's capacity, setting return to work dates, promoting the health benefits of good work, performing comprehensive clinical reviews, helping employers identify and plan their options with regard to return to work, and of course, diagnosis and treatment and developing management plans. And in our Australian systems, um, general practitioners are one party involved in these sorts of actions. The other notable ones being the worker themselves, of course, but also what we call case managers or return to work coordinators who are within our public or private insurance systems and also employers. So it's a very complex environment with lots of stakeholders and we're asking GPs to do a lot. Their roles go beyond certifying capacity uh, into all sorts of other things as well. And this is really reflected in um, the qualitative research that we have been doing over a number of years with GPs. So these, these data are from, a, these findings are from a qualitative study of general practitioners, insurance case managers, employers, and injured workers that we completed 
about seven or eight years ago now, where we invited those um, people to uh, speak to us about the barriers and enablers to engaging with general practitioners in Australian workers' compensation schemes. And um, the overarching themes that came through were about barriers. And all of the participants in this qualitative study really uh, identified multiple barriers, including uh, a lot of administration resulting in a, in a large administrative burden for GPs, low remuneration for time and effort relative to the um, time and effort, so relative to the remuneration that they would be um, provided working within our public healthcare system, delays in payments, and we haven't had until quite recently uh, automated payments for GPs working in our workers' compensation schemes, and they still don't exist in some of our compensation systems in Australia. Difficulty in finding specialists and allied healthcare practitioners to refer patients to because some of those other healthcare providers um, refuse to treat com uh, compensable patients in our schemes. The challenge of having conflicting medical opinions. So this might be um, through medical, uh, independent medical examinations commissioned by insurers or the lawyers acting on behalf of an injured worker or an employer, or it might be uh, having your medical opinion, opinion challenged by someone within an insurer about treatment you had recommended for the worker. A lack of understanding and knowledge of how workers' compensation systems operate and the rules and processes within which GPs are, are functioning and a lack of continuity and engagement with insurers. And that was really speaking about insurance case managers turning over quite regularly and GPs having to instruct and engage new case managers quite regularly about the patient that they're dealing with. And so our conclusion from this qualitative research is really that the system rules and processes um, are getting in the way of having an effective therapeutic relationship uh, between GP and their patients um, when those patients are involved in our workers' compensation schemes. And it also led many GPs to express the view that they were reluctant to treat some workers. And here are some quotes from this study where um, GPs were explaining why they were reluctant to treat injured workers. Um, first one talking about the extra time uh, taken to deal with people involved in workers' compensation cases. And the second one talking about the extra work involved in taking on new um, patients when they have a workers' compensation claim. Uh, multiple other um, references to and reasons for reluctance to treat as well. We've also conducted some survey-based research of Australian GPs on their, uh, their engagement in workers' compensation and return to work processes. And this is uh, some findings from a survey of over 400 GPs, again, that we conducted about five or six years ago. Where we asked them some things about what they do or their beliefs really uh, and attitudes about return to work. And pleasingly, we see here some things that we would really hope to see, such as the vast majority, nearly all of the GPs stating that they believe there's a health benefit to early return to work. Uh, most disagreeing with the statement that patients should only return to work when they are 100% fit. And most GPs also saying that they felt their role was to act as an advocate for the patient in the workers' compensation system and to support their navigation through that complex system. But also some more concerning um, trends in this study such as nearly two thirds of GPs stating that they, they thought the certificate of capacity which they required to complete in our schemes, they felt that that was the, the primary method of communication with other return to work stakeholders in our system, including insurers and employers, which probably suggests that there's not a lot of other communication going on. Um, two, three quarters or 77% stating that conflicting opinions between GPs and people working in our compensation authorities or insurers can actually get in the way of return to work and delay return to work, confirming what we were observing in our qualitative research. And most concerningly, nearly half of the GPs that we um, participated in this survey, 49% agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that they should have the right to refuse to treat patients with compensable injuries, which obviously creates barriers to access to care for people who are making workers' compensation claims in Australia. 
Okay, moving briefly on now to a focus on sickness certification or what has been called fit notes in some other jurisdictions. Australia, like uh, some other countries, notably the United Kingdom, I think, has really had a strong focus on changing the form of our medical certificates or what are called locally certificates of capacity and changing the emphasis from um, from writing sick notes to trying to encourage the health benefit to work and return to work as a form of recovery and to write what are known locally now as fit notes. And we've studied this in quite a lot of detail. I thought I'd just show you some of our findings. Um, sickness certification in the state of Victoria. So this is a, a large analysis of administrative workers' compensation claims data from the Victorian workers' compensation system over an eight year period involving over 120,000 individual workers making claims for workers' compensation. And what we did was look at um, the proportion of the first certificate written after the person was injured or became ill and looked at whether that was written as, a, as an unfit for work or a sick note or a fit for work or notes or a, or a fit note or something in between, which we called ultimate duties, where the GP was recommending that the person could return to work with modified hours or, or in, in different duties. And what we saw was that nearly three quarters of all of the initial certificates that written were sick notes. And then about 22, 23% were written as ultimate duty certificates. And only a very small proportion of cases were um, general practitioners writing certificates that recommended return to work for the workers. And the proportion of fit notes to sick notes and alternate duty certificates really varied um, depending on the type of condition that people had. So where people had musculoskeletal disorders, we saw a, a greater proportion of alternate duty certificates being written compared to where they had mental health conditions, in which case the overwhelming approach was to write people off sick We've also seen in the same study that um, general practice care in Australia is really concentrated. And we looked at the, the proportion of the number of GPs that were seeing workers by volume. And what we see here is that a small proportion of GPs, around about 12 or 13%, issue half of all the initial certificates in our workers' compensation schemes. And so there is a small group of GPs seeing a lot of injured workers and a large group of GPs seeing not very many injured workers in our workers' compensation scheme. We've also run some qualitative studies to try to understand the practice of sickness certification in our workers' compensation schemes. Again, this is in the state of Victoria. And once again, we've, we interviewed a range of different people to understand what was going on in these sickness certification um, interactions. Um, and the main findings from this were that certification is a sort of a complex administrative and clinical task that's underpinned by a host of social and systemic factors. It's not a simple matter of writing a certificate. There are many things going on in the certification discussion between a GP and their patient, and GPs are taking into account a lot of other information that they have at hand when they're making recommendations on the certificate. The doctors in this study were telling us that they considered certificates primarily to be a method of communication with the other stakeholders in the scheme. And the insurance case managers and employers were telling us that they considered the certificate to be a therapeutic tool and that they were looking for doctors to recommend return to work or give return to work dates or recommend alternate duties or activity that could help um, their patient return to work. And the major themes emerging from these interviews were really again about divergent views about the GP's role. So whether they were acting as a patient advocate or whether their role was to promote return to work. So once again, we see this sort of role conflict coming through. Again, about poor communication between stakeholders and about conflict between stakeholder groups around the content of certificates and what GPs were recommending. And some allegations by employers and insurers that GPs and workers were actually misusing certification to seek longer periods of time off work and then some discussion about the layout and the content of the certificate itself, which in some later work that, that we also uh, completed on behalf of some of the workers' compensation schemes in Australia has led to trials of new certificates where the order and content of the certificate has been changed to emphasize um, fitness for work 
or returns to work versus um, uh, sick, sickness or, or reasons not to work. Um, those trials, a bit like the research that we've seen coming out of the United Kingdom, haven't really shown us that changing the form of the certificate really leads to any change in certification practices at this stage in, in Australia anyway. I briefly wanted to talk about continuity of care. This is from some recent research that we've been doing where we have been building new data resources. Um, what we have in Australia with our complex arrangements of workers' compensation schemes is disaggregated data across multiple states, multiple insurers, um, and it becomes very difficult to get an understanding of what's going on in healthcare provision generally and in um, provision of general practice care specifically across all of those different situations. So we've been over the last few years embarking on uh, an effort to try to harmonise healthcare data from across multiple Australian workers' compensation jurisdictions. And effectively what we have done is taken data from individual databases in five jurisdictions and combined them into a harmonised database. And we've been looking at some particular issues using that data. We call it our multi-jurisdictional database. At the moment, it's limited to musculoskeletal disorder claims in those five Australian workers' compensation jurisdictions you can see on the screen here for a five-year period, but that is over 100,000 cases, or over 100,000 injured workers, and over 5 million episodes of health service use. And we've been looking at things like using this database to try to characterise healthcare use in people with musculoskeletal disorders, to explore cross-jurisdictional differences, to, and to develop quality of care indicators and to understand relationships between the healthcare that's being delivered and the duration of disability in our workers' compensation schemes. Now, one of the topics we've looked at to try to, I guess, um, begin to use this data is to look at continuity of care provided by general practitioners in our workers' compensation schemes. And so this is analysis of data from four of those jurisdictions combined in nearly 18,000 workers with accepted low back pain claims. And we've used a, a continuity of care index that is really just the, um, the proportion of times over which a worker sees a GP that they go back and see the same worker expressed as a percentage. And um, here on this slide, I'm showing you um, the uh, weeks of compensation paid or the total weeks for which the person was off work um, and the proportion of workers who have so it's a, sorry it's a survival curve in, in workers who have what we call low GP service use um, but these workers saw their GPs four to six times and using the criteria that we've established in this paper which we've just submitted we see that 28% of workers had what we call low to moderate continuity of care. And those who had low to moderate continuity of care, which meant that they were seeing multiple different GPs during the course of their workers' compensation claim, also had longer periods of time off work. It wasn't very apparent at the median, um, which you can see as the bottom red symbols there, about half a week difference um, in the duration of workers' um, Still on, still receiving workers' compensation time loss payments at the median. And we're talking about those with low to moderate continuity of care compared to those with high continuity of care. But at the 75th percentile, there's a big difference: 5.8 weeks uh, longer at um, at that percentile. So workers with low continuity of care were taking were still on benefits um, compared to those with perfect continuity of care where they were seeing the same GP. So what we're seeing in a nutshell here is that low continuity of care is associated with longer disability duration. This is really one of the uses that we're putting this database to. We have another number of other studies planned and underway using that data and some other data. Here are some of the issues that we are um, focusing on at the moment. I don't have time to go into all of these, but we have been doing things like exploring the impact of policy changes on service patterns, uh, looking at developing quality of care indicators for low back pain, um, using our workers' compensation data. We've been doing quite a lot of work looking at opioid prescribing and GPs involvement in opioid prescribing. In our Australian workers' compensation scheme, we're seeing some similar patterns to what we have observed in North America and other jurisdictions around opioid prescribing in workers' compensation. 
And we've also been linking our workers' compensation and publicly funded healthcare data sets, such as through the Medicare public healthcare system in Australia, to better understand the totality of primary care that is being delivered to injured mill workers. And at the moment, what we've been doing and some of the data I've been showing you is looking at what's been funded by our workers' compensation schemes during the during the worker rehabilitation period. But those workers may also be uh, receiving healthcare and indeed primary care from GPs that's funded through other systems such as Medicare system. So we're, we're trying to understand that holistic view uh, of the worker and, and their care provision by linking data sets. Um, I thought I'd just finish in the time that I have left to talk, to talk a little bit about where we have got to here. And we've got a long way in Australia since we started examining this topic uh, in detail over a decade ago. And very recently, our College of General Practitioners and the Faculty of Occupational Medicine has released some principles on the role of GPs in supporting work participation. These just came out late last year in October 2020. And what they're an attempt to do is to, to describe the multiple roles, those multiple complex roles that uh, or multiple roles and multiple stakeholders I talked about earlier in this presentation. And there are three broad principles. The first one is that GPs perform a, a patient advocacy role in work participation cases. So that involves uh, acting as a trusted advisor and advocate, advising the worker on health benefits work through a biopsychosocial approach, protecting the patient's privacy and helping patients to access services. The second principle is that GPs provide evidence-based assessment, which draws on the patient's own work participation goals and their context. So we're definitely, in these principles, you can see there's a strong theme about patient-centered care. And in this principle, it involves early and timely support, assessing functional capacity, doing that with the informed consent and with active patient input and emphasizing work as part of recovery. And the third principle then is that after those first two steps have been met, after the assessment and initial treatment, the GP will work out with their patient what role the GP takes from there on in. And that may take a number of forms. It could be providing advice to other stakeholders, employers and insurers on the functional capacity of the worker. And it could be things such as medical management, involvement in care coordination, monitoring patient outcomes, and acknowledgement that this role may change over time. So we're still seeing in this national position statement a multiplicity of roles for GPs in our workers' compensation schemes, which really, I think, reflects the way our systems are established. Another recent development, which I've had um, some involvement in as well, has been the development of clinical guidelines for the diagnosis, diagnosis and management of work-related mental health conditions in general practice. And um, of the conditions that we um, see relatively commonly in our workers' compensation schemes, mental health conditions were, were one subset where GPs in the qualitative research that we were undertaking were, were telling us that they had a lot of trouble with patients coming in with mental health conditions. They were additionally challenging over patients with other forms of injury or illness. And so we set out to develop some um, consensus-based and evidence-based guidelines which have subsequently been endorsed by our National Health and Medical Research Council and our Royal Australian College of GPs. And these recommendations deal with a broad range of things, including which assessment instruments to use, indicators of comorbid mental health problems, how to determine work-relatedness, um, approaches to education and communication of patients, assessing work capacity, communicating with the workplace, managing comorbid substance misuse and addiction, um, understanding factors that may uh, adversely affect prognosis or recovery, and some strategies for a lack of progression. And we currently have a, a funded trial underway where we're examining the implementation of these in around about 80 general pract practices around Australia. And I've provided a link to the guidelines via this slide. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the, the detail here. So that's a, a very rapid fire overview of some of the research that we have been um, conducting on the role of general practitioners in Australia. Um, what I'd like to do is just wrap that up and um, give you my view, I guess, on, on where we are in terms of evidence here, in terms of next steps. Uh, I would say that we, we have a substantial and a growing evidence base, and, and that tells us that 
GPs in our systems have multiple important roles. Um, it also tells us that changing certificates capacity, certificates of capacity from sick notes to fit notes has not been a magic bullet. It hasn't radically altered either certification practice or the duration of time workers are off work in our workers' compensation schemes. And that's because um, GPs perform those multiple roles and they have multiple forms of interaction and we're working within complex systems. You can see that the work of GPs and their interactions with their patients are really complicated by administrative challenges and that system complexity. We're seeing a large proportion of GPs actually stating that they would prefer not to treat workers' compensation patients, which has um, implications for access to care. And we're also starting to see some emerging evidence around the value of continuity of care uh, being associated with less time off work. Um, we're also starting to see, we're, we're moving, I guess, from that phase of developing and growing an evidence base into implementing and, and practice change. So we've seen things like national position statements on the role of GPs, which I gave you a very brief, brief overview of a minute ago, and national guidelines for, for mental health conditions. And uh, we're seeing new data sources be developed that will enhance our ability to monitor and evaluate this uh, issue as we move forward. But my, my view of this is that the implementation that we're seeing at the moment is still focused on requiring GPs to change their practice. Um, and what we're observing in the research are actually systemic challenges, which are about the way the system functions as a whole, the policies and practices that insurers and workers' compensation regulators and governments and employers have in place, as well as what the GPs are doing. And so if we're to get systemic change and to really maximise the value that GPs can add to worker rehabilitation in our Australian workers' compensation systems, I think we need to be dealing with those systemic issues. And we're still not doing that in Australia. And I hope that that becomes part of what we do in the future. I would like to leave it there. Um, time is up. I hope you've enjoyed that presentation and I look forward to speaking with you and hopefully answering some of your questions. Thank you.